Right, PC Give is one of the modules within Oxmetrics. As you'll see, it's listed on the left hand side of the screen under Modules, Model, and PC Give, and that's the one we're going to use. Obviously, you need to have data loaded, and that's been explained in the Oxmetrics session. I'll use a particular data set that's very small to illustrate how one uses the program and what one intends to achieve when using it. We've got models for time series data, as we have time series here, and single equation dynamic modeling using PC Give. But the modules are for many different types of data, cross-section data, discrete data, that's binary data, financial data, panel data, where you've got a time series of cross-sections, time series data, which will use Monte Carlo, which lets you simulate what you're doing, and I'll briefly discuss later, and other models that include some very special non-linear type of models. One can do both single equation and multiple equation modeling. One can also do regime shifting and Arfema, which is echoed in the at Garch program from Sebastian Laurent. So we take the default time series data, single equation modeling using PC Give, and we wish to formulate a model. This brings up the dialog for formulating a model, and we have variables in the database, consumption, income, and price level, which is, these are in constant prices and can be converted back to nominal, and then the logs in lowercase, the log of consumption, the log of income, and the log of prices. When one clicks on a variable on the database, it'll appear in the selection side. We need to do two things. One is to set the lag length. This is quarterly, not seasonally adjusted data. So there'll be behavior going back up to five quarters. Imagine that you're in Christmas two years ago and you've bought your brother or sister or father or mother a somewhat bigger present than usual. You kind of feel when you get to Christmas this year that perhaps you have to echo that. And that means that what you did roughly five quarters ago is still affecting your behavior today. So we'll double click in consumption. And as you'll see, we'll get up to five lags in here. You can also just highlight it and push it across with income that'll give us five lags. Now the data is very seasonal. So we'll also put in some dummy variables for seasonality. Seasonal is just a variable which is one for the first quarter, then zero for the next three, then a second one that's zero for the first quarter, one for the second and zero for the next two, and so on. In C seasonal, they're adjusted for the mean, and we'll use those because we've already got a constant in the model to pick up the average over a long term. So we'll click on OK, and we get to choose a model type. Well, here, we're just going to use ordinary squares, but you can choose instrumental variables. And we're not yet going to use the automatic model selection. It's we'll do it rather than let the computer do it just for the moment. So OK, and we get the estimation sample 1956 second quarter to 1993 second quarter. We can start or end anywhere within those limits. And then we can choose the number of forecasts Let's have 10, so we can look at how well the model does for 10 quarters outside the particular period, which would therefore end in 1991, quarter four. Click on OK, and we get the estimates of the parameters in the model. We've got five lags of consumption, the constant term, the five lags of income, and the seasonals. The t-values tell you how important statistically, how substantive the impact is of the given variable. So with C1, it's very large. C2, it's not significant at all. C4 is very large, and so it's C5. These are the echoes of what you did in each quarter the year earlier. And with income, we find the same kind of pattern, the first one, and then back at four periods. And some of the seasonals matter greatly. Down below are a number of important statistics. Sigma is the standard deviation of the residuals or the estimate of the equation error variance, and that's just under 1%. Since these are in logs, if you were to multiply by 100, that would take it to 0.9, which is 0.98 
of a percent, which is roughly 1%. The R-squared is obviously extremely high because the data are both trending and seasonal. Turns out we can forecast the next 10 quarters using this model without too much difficulty. But if we come down just a little bit, we get the tests of the model. Is it well specified or not? And it turns out it's not particularly well specified. There's still autocorrelation in the residuals, and there's still some heteroskedasticity suggesting there are problems to be fixed. If we go to the graphics, we can get a graphic picture of the model. These are the data and the fitted values. You can see the strong trend, which gives the very high R-squared, and the fitted values are quite reasonable. And down here we get the errors, the residuals, the deviations between the fitted and actual values. And there are one or two mm, fairly large, uh, what we might call outliers, but the forecasts that we make don't look too bad, except they've all got the same sign. So we've over-predicted most of the period after the end of the sample. So we can either use the icon for test to pick it up, or we can go to the model menu and click and test, or there's a shortcut which is Alt-T, which you hold down the Alt-T, Alt-Key and press T. We'll just click and test here, and it brings up the test menu. There's graphic analysis, dynamic analysis, forecast analysis, further output. You can do more detailed tests. We've already seen the test summary. You can test whether to exclude variables. You can test if linear restrictions are satisfied or indeed general restrictions. You can test if you've omitted important variables and you can also store the residuals in the database. We'll simply, for the moment, do graphic analysis. And if we tick the box and then click OK, we'll pick up Actual and fitted are already the default selection, residual scaled. I'm going to cut out the forecast and outcomes for the moment to get a four block diagram with the residual density and the histogram, where the density is just a smooth version of the histogram, and the residual autocorrelation function. And if we click in OK, we'll get a four way picture of which you've seen the first two from the previous figure. And here we get the histogram of the residuals, the green line, which I'll change to dotted so it's more obvious. The, now the dashed line is the interpolated density with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one for a normal. The histogram, the blocky picture, and then the red is the smoothed version of the histogram. And you can see that, in fact, there's a problem out here. A few of the residuals are much larger than you'd expect for a normal distribution. The autocorrelation function shows some residual autocorrelation and quite a lot back at 11, although something as far back as that might well be spurious. Mm -hmm.